this morning, but, <laughs> but Steve, you want to come up here? <laughs> he would, and he'd do a better job. You know, when I say foolish things like that, Brother Bill hangs his head because whenever our men fill in and preach, Bill will come by and say, if I was the preacher here, I'd be getting a little nervous, you know. So Bill's wondering, don't ever do that, Ken. Don't, don't, you know, give up your own position there. Well, we departed for two weeks from our normal Sunday morning series that we've been setting forth. And so this morning we're going back to that series. Uh, that series, of course, is entitled The Master's Disciple. The Master's Disciple. We also said we could have entitled this The Master's Student, The Master's Pupil. But remember, when we talk about a disciple, we're talking about a learner, okay? As a disciple of Christ, as his student, as his pupil, you're to be a learner. I am to be a learner. We learn from him. We learn of him. And so remember this. This is important. We need to remind ourselves. This series follows on the heels of one that we began this year with, the master teacher. The master teacher. Really the purpose for that series, here it is, to exalt our Savior. Our focus was upon Him. Our praise, our exaltation was to Him. Well, this series, The Master's Disciple, I think we've got one purpose for this series, and it is this, to examine our self. Yes, the Master Teacher, to exalt our Savior the master's disciple, to examine our self. Remember the Bible says, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. Test yourselves. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Also in Lamentations 3 and verse 40. Let us examine and probe our ways and let us return again to our God. You see, when we look at this first series, we understand that we have an awesome Savior. When we look at this second series, we should understand that we have an awesome responsibility. As a disciple, as a student, as a pupil, as a learner of Jesus the Christ. Now, notice this. What kind of disciple does he desire. If I'm his disciple, I better know what kind of disciple he wants. What kind of disciple does he desire? Well, you remember in John 2 and verse 5 what Mary says? Whatever he, speaking of Jesus, whatever he says to you, do it. That's the kind of disciple he desires. You remember the example of Noah given in Genesis 6 and verse 22? Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. That's the kind of disciple I need to be. What did Jesus say in Matthew 7 and verse 21? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. And so what kind of a disciple does he desire? One who does his will. What kind of disciple does he deserve? Well, he deserves the very best, does he not? The very best that I can give him, the very best that you can give him. We need to obey from the heart. Romans 6 and verse 17. Whatever your hands find to do, verily do it with all of your might. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10. That's what he deserves. The Macedonians, they first gave themselves to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 5. What kind of disciple does he desire? What kind of disciple does he deserve? What kind of disciple does he demand? 
Did you listen to the scripture reading this morning? Doug took us to Luke 14, verses 25 through 33. If we love anyone else more than him, we cannot be his disciple. He demands that love. If we do not take up our cross and follow him, we cannot be his disciple. He demands that of us. And if we don't forsake all that we have to follow him, we cannot be his disciple. He demands that. That's why in the middle of Luke 14, when he's talking about these things, he wants you, he wants me to count the cost. There is a cost behind discipleship. Am I willing to pay the price? So what kind of disciple does he desire? What kind of disciple does he deserve? What kind does he demand? And what kind does he delight in? Well, it's what we've already mentioned, isn't it? It's that disciple that bears much fruit. John 15 and verse 8. It's that disciple unto whom he can say, Well done, you good and faithful servant. Matthew 25 and verse 21. And so we need to ask ourselves the question. Remember, we're examining ourselves. We claim to be his disciple. Am I the kind of disciple that he so demands and deserves? Now, please hang with me. Follow with me. This next slide, don't let it throw you. Yes, it's still a part of this same lesson. I haven't lost my mind. I didn't just put something in there that has nothing to do with what we're looking at. But notice where we're going. Look at this, Newt Rockney's Four Rules for Recruiting Student Athletes. Well, he demanded something of his athletes. If you know anything concerning Newt Rockney, an interesting study. He was born Newt Kenneth Rockney. He was born in Voss, Norway. And at the age of five, he immigrated with his parents to Chicago. Uh, he's considered to be one of, if not the greatest, college football coaches in our history. He played football at Notre Dame and he coached at Notre Dame. His overall record was 105 wins, 12 losses, and 5 ties. And this is what is stated, just part of his biography at the College Football Hall of Fame. Part of his biography includes this. Without question, American football's most renowned coach. He won five national titles in 1919, 1920, 1924, 1929, and 1930. But as we've suggested, he had some qualifications for his players. He expected something of his players. And so what I want us to do is to look at these four rules and make sure that we give them a spiritual emphasis. I believe he was so successful because of what he demanded from his players. We've already mentioned no, we're not talking about lining up and playing football for Newt Rockney. We're talking about something more important. We're talking about following the Christ. We're talking about obeying his will. Just as Newt Rockney demanded something of his student athletes, Jesus demands something of us. And you can take these four rules here that worked for him beautifully, wonderfully, powerfully, and when you make spiritual application, you'll see, yes, Jesus demands the same thing. Notice the first rule. Notice this. He said, I will not have a boy with a swelled head. You cannot teach him anything. Well, you see this in any facet of life. The know-it-all, the one that's already arrived you can't teach him or her one thing because they already know it. 
They know more than you. They know more than their employer. They know more than their teacher. They know more than anyone. They know more than their parents. And so he said, I will not have a boy with a swelled head. What's he talking about here? It's pride, isn't it? He will not have a proud individual. Why? They're useless. You can't teach him anything. Do you remember in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 1? It states in that context, knowledge puffs up. But love edifies. I like what someone said about that verse. There are two ways to grow in Christ. We can either swell up, and that's what they did in Corinth. Knowledge puffs up. They were puffed up. They were proud. We can either swell up in the kingdom, or we can grow up. The first is pride. The second is humility. Just as Rockney said, I won't have a proud individual on the team. Jesus says, you can't be my disciple if your heart is filled with pride. Remember James 4 in verse 6, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16 and verse 18. That's why in 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, verses 5 and following, Peter is emphasizing humility. He's trying to destroy pride within us. We're to clothe ourselves with humility. Remember Obadiah, verse 3? The pride of your heart has deceived you. Read Jeremiah 48 and verse 29 this afternoon. You can flip to it now if you just want to read that verse and then come back to us, okay? But don't start reading everything else. But six times God uses words to describe the pride of Moab. I don't think you can turn to any other verse in the Bible and see pride in all of its foolishness. Let me ask you a question. How do you think the God of heaven views my pride, views your pride? Is it not disgusting? Is it not distasteful to him? Is it not disgraceful? Who do we think we are as we approach God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and we do so with pride and arrogance? And so, Newt Rockney said, and this proved good for him, I will not have a boy with a swelled head. You cannot teach him anything. And so as a disciple of Christ, I need to put aside pride. I need to fill my heart, my life with humility. Jesus was meek and lowly in heart. Remember Matthew 11 and verse 29? If anyone could have been filled with pride, it was him. But he wasn't. And again, Satan is still tempting us through the pride of life. That's one of those three avenues that he wreaks havoc in our lives. And so as a disciple of Christ, let's listen to these words. I will not have a boy with a swelled head. You cannot teach him anything. Look at this next one. I will not have a kicker, griper, or complainer. Again, you know why. Just like earlier, that first point, pride affects everything within us. It affects every relationship. It affects friendships. It affects marriage. It affects the home. It affects the family. It affects everything. Well, just like pride does that in a destructive fashion, these things right here destroy morale. And so he says, I'm not going to have a proud individual, nor am I going to have a kicker, griper, or complainer. Why? You get that person on the team, they're going to destroy team morale. Again. Problems in the church many times are caused by an individual's attitude. 
And these things emerge because of pride. You remember James 5 and verse 19? Do not grumble, my brethren, against one another. Again, that grumbler against brethren. Again, how that destroys the very fabric, uh, fiber of the church. Think about Philippians 2 and verse 14. Do all things without disputings and murmurings. One translation, complaining. Again, that doesn't do any good for you. It doesn't do any good for others. It doesn't do any good for the church of our Lord. And so he understood that. He's not going to tolerate that. Listen to what the Bible tells us. I want to read just a couple of verses. Proverbs 22 and verse 10. This is what inspiration says, cast out the scoffer and contention will leave yes strife and reproach will cease so God says the same thing you've got that scoffer you've got that contentious person remember one of the things God hates is one who sows strife with his brethren Proverbs 6 verses 16 through 19 and so you cast out the scoffer you cast out that contention pers contentious person. And guess what? Strife ceases. Now morale can get back to normal. Look at what the New Testament tells us. Titus 3, verses 10 and 11. Listen to this as I read it. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Again, reject that man. Why? That person is warped. There's something wrong with that individual. They are sinning, and that sin, they are self-condemned. Well, look at the opposite of that, though. Not the contentious person, but think about a man in the book of Acts that every time you see him, he is about the Father's business, and he's always helping his brethren, Barnabas. Barnabas, just the opposite of this. We don't need this. We need Barnabas's. He's the son of consolation, the son of encouragement. Acts 4 and verse 36. He's a team player. He's unselfish. He's going to help make others better on and off the field in and out of the church. He's that kind of person. And so a disciple of Christ, yes. But again, not a kicker, not a griper, not a complainer. New Rockne also said this, I will allow no dissipation. Dissipation is a life given to excess, especially regarding drink. He said, I'm not going to have it. I allow no dissipation. Now, if you're like me, you're sitting there hearing what this coach of yesteryear said he's not going to have and comparing it with coaches today. <laughs> There's not a lot of comparison, not in the collegiate realm. Some of these things are the very things they're offering to get a player of talent to come their direction. But he says, I will allow no dissipation dissipation. It's not going to happen. Again, I want us to think about this because we're disciples of Christ. We're learners of Christ. We, as we mentioned last week, we have the highest calling there is. We're doing the greatest work that this world has ever seen, except for the work that our blessed Lord did upon this earth. And so once again, we don't need the dissipation. We don't need the life given to excess. We need to live a life that is controlled by our God. You remember what 1 Peter 1 and verse 16 says? Be thou holy, for I am holy. God gave us the greatest impetus for holiness right there. 
Why all this about purity, Father? Why all of this about holiness? He says, I'll tell you, because I'm holy. I want you as my children to be like me. Remember what Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5 and verse 8. You remember Hebrews 1 and verse 9? Jesus hated lawlessness. He loved righteousness. Question, how on earth can I claim to be his follower? How can I claim to be his disciple and not hate lawlessness and not love righteousness? Philippians 2 and verse 5 says, Have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. My mind, my attitude is to be like his. It's sad when you see someone in the church claiming to be a disciple of Christ and they love lawlessness. They hate righteousness. At least that's what their life is suggesting because they're not living for the Lord. They're doing whatever they so please. Their life is not dominated by the fruit of the Spirit, but rather by the works of the flesh. Again, think about this. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19, the firm foundation of God stands sure having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's what we're to do. To depart from iniquity. Not see how close we can get to iniquity. And see how cute we can appear to the world. But to depart from iniquity. 1 Peter 4 verses 2 and following. Peter's telling his brethren after their conversion that the world doesn't understand why you no longer run with them to the same excess of dissipation. There's that language. They've been converted to Christ. They're now a disciple of Christ. They don't live like that anymore. And you know what he says in 1 Peter 4 and verse 2? He says, we don't live for the lusts of men, but rather for the will of God. Well, there's a big difference there. Many today are living for the lusts of men. That's what their lives are all about. Not according to the will of God. Remember, we're to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I'll receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 17 and 18. We're not to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds that we might prove what the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Do you remember when Moses and Aaron would stand before the Pharaoh? And a lot of times he would say, yeah, I'll let you go. And then when the plague was removed, he's right back saying, you're not going anywhere. Well, later on in all of these confrontations, he offers Moses a compromise package. He says, you can go. You can go, the men can go, the women can go, the children can go, but your herds stay here. I love what Moses responded and told him. He said, not one hoof will be left behind. He said, we're not going for that compromise package. We're going, and we're taking the flock, the herd, with us. With that, remember, they would offer sacrifices to God. That was preeminent in their minds. But here's what I'm saying. When God calls you through the gospel to become his disciple, when he calls me through the glorious good news to be his follower, I need to say the same thing. I'm leaving this world, and guess what? Not one hoof is left behind. I'm not going to straddle the fence. I'm not going to try to live like the world and claim to be a child of God. Brethren, it's an all or nothing proposition. Jesus wants you. He wants all of you. He wants your heart, your soul, and your mind. And again, that's not asking too much.
That's really asking very little when you look at what he gave up for us. And so he says, New Rockne, I will allow no dissipation. Here's the last thing. Here's the last thing, and oh, how important this is. I will not have a boy with an inferiority complex. He must believe that he can accomplish something. <laughs> See, if you're going to play football for Newt Rockney, he's demanding. But he says, you know what? I can't have this person that has an inferiority complex. The one that I want to come upon the field with me is one that knows he can accomplish something. My friend, I don't know where you are in life. Okay, I don't know if you're a child of God. I don't know if you're still serving Satan. But I know this. Everyone still in the world, I know what Satan likes to tell people. You can't be a Christian. You can't live up to the high ideal of Christ. In fact, look at how you've lived. You've sinned. You're not worthy to be called a Christian. Let me tell you something. If you're here this morning never obeyed the gospel and that's part of the reason why you're still holding back every one of us have dealt with the same thing we've all sinned Satan would love nothing better than to use my past sin to impede my future progress if he could say Ken you've sinned don't you remember that? You've sinned against God Almighty, and you think you're going to serve Him? Yeah, absolutely, because He wants me to. He said, I can. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23 and verse 34. The one who died for my sin on the cross, He said, you can do better than that. I can show you a better way. You can walk in my footsteps. What did Paul say? Paul says on one hand, I am the chief of sinners. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15. But you know what he also said? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 13. Don't you want Paul on your side? I'm glad and I'm sure that the first century Christians were glad that Paul was on their side. At one time, he's breathing out murders and threats against the disciples. Chapter 8 of Acts, chapter 9 of Acts. But now he's one of them. He's teaching. He's preaching. He said, I labored more than them all. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. And he's talking about the other apostles. This man was dynamic in the kingdom. He was unstoppable in the kingdom. Why? Because he believed he could do something. He believed that with his Lord's help, he could serve him. He could glorify him. He could build up the body of Christ. He could live acceptably in this life, and he could go to heaven one day. My friend, you can do the same thing. Don't ever let anyone say, your past, your past, it's too evil. It's too shady. We're not talking about your past right now. Now, you've got to deal with your past, no doubt. We're talking about your future. Don't you dare let sin in the past destroy the future life you could have right now, the present life, the future life. You can live the Christian life. Oh, it's not easy. We've already said you've got to count the cost. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. But you've got a God who loves you. When you're prodigal, when you're wasteful, you come back to him just like the prodigal son did. And he'll forgive you. You've got brothers and sisters in Christ here who care about you. They're going to help you along your journey. They're going to help you walk the straight and narrow. Yes, you can live the Christian life. And so as we think about these four rules for recruiting student athletes, they worked, they will still work. This is what our Lord expects of us. He desires it. He deserves it. He demands it. He delights in it. Let's, brethren, be about his business. If we truly believe, and we ought to, 
that there's no greater calling than to become a Christian. Let's live up to that calling. If we truly believe that we can live the Christian life, let's live the Christian life. And my friend, if you know today what you must do to be saved, you've thought about doing it, but you've just been holding yourself back, how long are you going to do that? How long are you going to listen to Satan? How long are you going to live for him? You tell him what Jesus said, be gone, Satan. Matthew 4 and verse 10. You do what Jesus did. You always do the will of your Father in heaven. Again, that's what he says in John 8 and verse 29. I always do those things that are pleasing to him. Let's start having that mindset. Let's start living that kind of a life. And I'll guarantee you this, you'll be happy beyond compare. You'll be fulfilled. You'll be contented. You'll be satisfied with this life because you're doing something worthwhile in the kingdom. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. If you need to come to become a child of God, to become a disciple of Christ, we're going to ask you as we sing the song to come forward. If you need to study further, there are many here who would love that opportunity. If you already know what to do to be saved, let's do it. Let's do that this morning. If you're a brother or sister in Christ, you've wandered, you've strayed, you've fallen away, you haven't been as zealous, you've left that first love, let's get back to serving the Lord right now while we stand and as we sing.